Hold on on tight tight for the the next next hour. hour. You're entering entering into a place, a zone zone called called the alternative to the alternative media. It's a place, a special place, where even truth seekers fear to tread. All right, people, let's move like we've got a purpose. Affirmative. Okay, welcome back to the Investigative Journal. Uh, Greg Anthony here on this January 24th, 2017 day on our calendar. And my guest today is attorney John Levy. He's been with me many, many times over the years. And even yesterday, I referred uh, in my show regarding a case that he brought against the Vatican years ago. And we're going to get into that. And John's got a whole bunch of other things uh, to talk about regarding cases overseas And uh, before I do that, let me give you my opening monologue. You know, over the years, I've tried to show the Vatican and Jesuit connection to major events in history. Nothing has changed. It still goes on today as both accepted mainstream historians and journalists either purposely or unknowingly cover up this connection. One of the most important parts of our history are the years preceding, during, and after the American Revolution. We have all heard the story given to us in school, but the question surfaces after careful scrutiny of hidden facts. Are these accounts true? What was the true purpose of the creation of America, and who really was behind it? Two characters and their vital roles left out of the history books are Charles Thompson and Jesuit General Lorenzo Ricci. But who are they, and why are they important? Let me briefly explain. Charles Thompson was the keeper of records, the transcriber of all the events prior to, during, and after the revolution. He was considered the man of truth and recorded every bit, everything in the Continental Congress, as well as knowing everything that went on behind the scenes. Now, when he retired, Thompson was asked, could you tell us You know, just like journalists today, can you tell us what really went on in history? What really went on behind the scenes? And he always refused. His records, he recorded everything, and he wrote a book, but it was kept secret. And it's somewhere today, either in the, I consider, either in the Vatican archives or perhaps in a Masonic lodge. But he was asked by one person back then, Can you tell us something? And he said something very interesting. He said, this country would not have been founded without the agency of providence. And what that meant back then, agency of providence, providence, of course, was Christ or God. The agency was well known back then as the Vatican. And Thompson, a historian, not only in the secular world, but a biblical historian, knew this quite well. He also went on to say that he did not want to tell the real story because he did not want to give a impression to the future leaders that he didn't want to deceive the American people. And he said he hoped that future leaders would live up to the story that's been told. Now, a second person that's interesting, and I'll do this very quickly because I want to get to John, is Lorenzo Ricci. Now, he was a Jesuit general during the period the history books tell us the Jesuits were disbanded prior to the American Revolution. Our history books tell us that Ricci was imprisoned and died in Rome prior to the Revolution. But did he really die? Now, to make a long story short, the facts in this case show that there is a good possibility that he is one of the hidden founding fathers that he never died, and he actually orchestrated the war, the Revolutionary War, and he, in fact, was a person that even created the first American flag and was very instrumental behind the scenes instructing the Founding Fathers that we know. Now, you can go back to all my shows and get the facts that have been hidden regarding this part in history. I think it's the most vital part of history that's been uh, covered up. And if Americans understood this, we would have a whole different idea regarding our country. Now, 
as I get to John Levy right now, John has showed us through the cases that he's taken in the appellate courts that the Vatican still has its dirty hands in our political affairs. And I'm not giving you conspiracy theory like many of my listeners say. I'm giving you facts. And that's why I brought John on today to basically relive and retell us a little bit about the history of Alperin v. Vatican Bank because it gets forgotten quite easily with everything that's going on in the world. But John, what's your thoughts about what I said and also regarding this hidden hand, even in our judiciary, if you look at the case that you tried to get justice for genocide victims, clearly the Vatican was involved. Your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Well, hey, Greg, good, good to talk with you again. Um, let me tell you, the, the, the hidden hand is there. Um, in, in fact, we've seen in the U.S. the opening. You know, we, we've actually seen more than the hidden hand when the Pope kind of came out of the woodwork during the presidential campaign and tried to intervene directly and then sort of backed off. But the hidden hand is definitely there. The Vatican Bank, for example, I mean, they're tremendously influential in international finances. I mean, we don't even know even 1% of what they're up to. So, you know, you talk about your George Soros being, um, you know, influential, but compared to, you know, George Soros is transparent, transparency incarnate depend you know uh, compared to the vatican bank i mean they 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 are in there so deep and so well covered um you know you you need an x-ray machine to you know smoke (laughs) them out find out what they're doing now you know the your case alpern v vatican bank tell us why that's important because it really shows this uh uh, the cover-up by even our court system yeah, well, the, the Alperin v. Uh, versus Vatican Bank case was a class action based on a uh, report by the U.S. government that uh, the Vatican Bank had laundered money, uh, fascist money, Nazi money from the Second World War. It was all about that, and a lot of the money came from concentration camp gold and all sorts of ill-gotten gains. And we sued the Vatican Bank, and Really, we were the first ones to ever really sue them. They were stunned. I mean, we got back a letter from their president saying, you can't do that. Go take away your lawsuit. <laughs> that, that's how powerful they felt. They felt they were above the law and that how dare you file a lawsuit against us asking us to show our books <laughs> and uh, show our accounts and uh, pay restitution. So that was the first time that happened. And as a result of that, a lot of information came out in discovery. Um, we uh, learned a, a huge amount about Vatican Bank operations, for example, um, at least what they were publicly willing to talk about. We learned historically how they operated and how they were funded and uh, what, what they really are, because the word bank doesn't really describe what they do. So that's why the lawsuit was significant. What do they do? And if it, if uh, when you said that bank doesn't describe what they do, right? Well, the, the real name for the Vatican Bank is the Vatican Bank is like a nickname. That's not their operating title. Their operating title is the Institute for Religious Works. Okay. It not it doesn't it say anything about a bank, and it's under the direction of the Holy See and Vatican City. And it is not like their Ministry of Finance. They have a Ministry of Finance. It's um, it's not like uh, the APSA, which is like their Treasury. It's not like that either. The purpose of the Institute for Religious Works, or what we call the Vatican Bank, is to bring money in from the outside and act as a financial um, balancer in the world markets. Uh, so, so what is they? How do they do that? Well, they. It, their charter allows them to take both movable and immovable property. So any sort of property under the sun can be brought into the Vatican Bank, anything, as long as a portion of it is earmarked for what they call pietical purposes. And that's what they do. So, so before you go on, let me get this straight, So I'm a simple guy here. Uh, they, they've set up two different types of banks then, so so to speak, right? Two different organizations. Three. 
They've got three financial organizations, and that's the confusion. When we talk about Vatican Bank and the press, they're, they're often talking about one or all three. So there's a Ministry of Finance called the Ministry of Economics in their jargon, which, which operates as like a treasury department, okay, sets the policy, sets the rules, probably uh, engages in some central banking. Then they have a sister organization um, called the uh, APSA, A-P-S-A, Apostolic Patrimony of the Holy See, uh, in English. So, <laughs> and that's that's like a holding holding bank where they they keep all the really good stuff, the money, the gold, all that is um, under the control of APSA. So um, that. Uh, you know, is is understandable. That's where that's like their another treasury, a big lockbox. But Institute for Religious Works, that's their uh, sword. That's the one they go out into the world and mess with with uh, finances in other countries, uh, engage in money laundering, and uh, make uh, investments, or social investments, however you want to term it. You know, I might add though, people have always said, well, the Vatican is a can't do money laundering, but I can say for a fact. Uh, when I was in Rome working during the 80s, uh, the case, uh, cases were right there. The Italian government had sued the Vatican Bank. The reports in all the French and Italian papers talked of this money laundering operation that was so extensive, the biggest scandal they've ever been in. Do people really think they've changed in 20 years, John? I think your case shows they haven't. Go ahead. No, no, they've, they've simply adapted. So they, they've, uh, have, they've had, if you look at, a, do any research on Google or whatever, and you type in Vatican Bank and money and laundering, you'll not see one scandal. You'll see dozens of them. They have several every year. Just for example, the Italian courts uh, sentenced or are, sent, are busy sentencing the former uh, one of the former managers at the Vatican Bank and his deputy for some kind of money laundering. So it, it's it's constantly going on over there. Uh, but they've adapted. Uh, for example. Uh, they instead of using the Italian lira, they they have to use the uh, euro now, and that makes it more difficult for the Vatican Bank because they have to pretend to conform with the uh, euro bank system and uh, not uh, engage in money laundering. So they've gotten more sophisticated, but but nonetheless, think about it: a gigantic bank off the books. They don't they don't publish any real accounts. Who's the shareholders? Nobody knows. Um, they claim there aren't any. Who controls it? Nobody knows. It, it supposedly they make money, and if they make a profit, they're supposed to hand it to the Pope. Um, so, for example, if I was a guy like member Mark Rich, who was on the FBI ten most wanted list that Clinton pardoned, if I was Mark Rich and I wanted to launder a couple million dollars and hide some jewels or whatever, I could go right to the Vatican Bank and they wouldn't question it, right? Very simple. You would simply set up a charitable foundation with the name of a saint in front of it, like the St. Eustatius Fund or something like that. Find a cooperative priest to be the nominal head. There's plenty of, uh, I'm sure you can vouch for the fact there's plenty of itinerant, itinerant priests and monsignors walking the earth looking for employment, isn't there? <laughs> and uh, real, real ones or fake ones, because think about it, the Vatican doesn't even know who's a priest, which is a whole other issue. Um, there, there's a lot of fake priests walking around. So you, get a, you get a priest, stick him, a so-called priest, stick him on the board, make him the director, and then he goes to the Vatican Bank with some uh, credentials and uh, opens an account. And the Vatican Bank will say, what's in it for us? They'll say, oh, the usual 10%. Okay, you're in. Wow. Now, in Alpern v. Vatican Bank, when you started this case well over a decade ago, did you realize these hurdles were there? How did you learn of all this stuff through this case? Yeah, exactly. Actually, we thought, my co-counsel Tom Easton and I, thought it would be a slam dunk because, after all, the U.S. State Department had come out with the report indicting the Vatican. So we thought, oh, we'll just file this. You know, the Clinton administration will hop right in there, and before long we'll be rolling in dough with the settlement. Well, that's not what happened, Greg. The Clinton administration did a 180-degree turnaround after the Vatican started screaming, you know, bloody murder about being sued and suddenly forgot they had done this report. And the U.S. courts uh, essentially were on the side of the Vatican for 10 years before kicking us out. I mean, they couldn't kick us out right away because it was such a strong indictment of the Vatican Bank. Yeah, tell us a few of the facts that you found out regarding uh – 
the CIA, some of the testimony that showed they were involved in the, it basically involved in this genocide in uh, in Croatia. Yeah, well, the uh, we, we had some great testimony. We had a four-day deposition by former U.S. Special Agent William Gowan, who every there was no dispute he had investigated the Vatican Bank back in forty-six, forty-seven when he was stationed in Rome as part of the Army Counterintelligence, and he worked with people like James Angleton former deputy director of the CIA, and uh, Angleton actually was his nemesis. But, uh, you know, we had his testimony, and, and what we found out was just just how enmeshed the Vatican Bank was with MI6 and the CIA. Uh, if they wanted MI6 or CIA wanted to move money around, they used the Vatican Bank. In fact, that was their go-to bank in Europe, or one of them. Until such time as uh, they got exposed during the uh, Bishop Marcinkus affair, there, right? Right. When I, yeah, I was there right for that. Sindona and all the rest of them, it started to fall apart. But the CIA laundered billions of dollars uh, through the Vatican Bank, which was most cooperative. You know, they got their ten percent, and they were fighting communism, and they were happy. So it was really like a branch bank of the CIA for a long time there. Well, so anyway, the. So you find out all this stuff. Now, did did uh, the testimony in the deposition actually show that they were involved not only in the money laundering, but the actual torture of some of the and killings of these people? Yeah, well, the, not the Vatican Bank itself, but the people they worked with. The, for example, the, the funds deposited at the Vatican Bank paid for the infamous rat lines, which, which was the system that the Vatican had with the CIA and MI6 were removing Nazis and other fascists from Europe and redistributing them around the world as anti-communist assets. So the famous Klaus Barbie case, a uh, high-ranking high Gestapo member, was moved from Europe to Bolivia. Um, and, and, you know, other, other high-ranking Nazis, how did they get to all these places, Argentina, Colombia, uh, Canada, Australia, Syria, wherever? I mean, they were moved via the rat lines, which was funded by the Vatican Bank. And also, of course, during the Second World War, um, the Vatican Bank was, of course, they were accepting deposits from Nazi-occupied Europe, from the Nazis themselves. I mean, that's why they were set up, for example, who was depositing money in there during World War II. Well, mainly Nazis who wanted to bank somewhere uh, for the future. <laughs> wow. And so you find this connection and you start bringing all this information to the courts. You were in the Ninth Circuit, I believe, right? Yeah, and right. Uh, tell us the outcome, what they said. Well, they, they, they really um, jammed away at us over three different court cases over a period of 10 years or so. And, you know, we died by a thousand cuts. But uh, eventually what they said was, oh, you can't sue the Vatican Bank in the United States because you can't prove that the Vatican Bank brought gold to the U.S. Um, therefore, no jurisdiction here. And we said, well, wait a minute. We did prove when we did have proof. We had proof that the Vatican Bank had gold on deposit uh, with the Federal Reserve right. from that time period. And they said, <laughs> but you cannot prove that that's the exact same gold that the Nazis put in the bank down there. And we said, what? And we said, wait a minute. Gold, as you know, Greg, gold's what, what we call a legal term fungible. And, and what that means is one piece of gold is the same as the next. So if they had gold over in Rome, um, they didn't even have to move the gold to the Federal Reserve, Reserve in New York. The, the Federal Reserve in New York might say, okay, you've got the gold there. We'll front you some of our gold. You send that gold somewhere else. <laughs> so it, all, all the gold's mixed up. It's, it, it's like, uh, you know, like an Arab uh, money laundering thing. What is that, a halla? You know, how they right. change money. And they, and they, it, worked the same, it works the same way with gold. You don't, sometimes you ship the gold, sometimes you don't. And again, what, what's to stop the Vatican? The Vatican surely didn't keep gold with swastikas on it. I mean, the first thing they did <laughs> after the Second War was melt that down and recast it. You know, and put uh, the, the, the keys of St. Peter's on there or something. You can't tell that if that gold came from somebody's teeth in a concentration camp or from, from a mine. And, uh, but, but the uh, Ninth Circuit said, well, you have to prove. You have to prove where that gold came from. You can't just say it came from the Vatican. That's not good enough. 
So that, that's where they threw us so out. So they were saying, in essence, they don't do business here, correct? That's right, which is a lie. We, 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 uh, you know, it, every single diocese in the U.S. has a Vatican bank account because that's how they uh, they, they get the Peter's pens from the suckers, I mean parishioners. <laughs> donate money to the Vatican, like, like the, and, and they remit that tribute every year to the Vatican. And it's not that much, but it's a few million, you know. And I bet you if I just walked out on the street today and asked people, nobody's ever heard of this. How come the media, the me, it shows you the media is also in their pocket. <laughs> well, no, the media is, is terrible. What the media will do is every year the Vatican puts out its financial report. And you've seen it. Mm -hmm. It's some ridiculous thing. Oh, we took in $18 billion and expended $26 million. We'll try to do better next year. I'm like, what? <laughs> 18 million then it's like it's not even the price of one painting you have at the uh, vatican museum but where, where, where's all the money you took it from uh those very expensive tickets that people buy for the vatican museum i mean it is just ridiculous they just make up some figures and get some auditor from a big auditing firm to put his uh, imprint on it hey to end this first segment uh so what'd you do from there just to refresh our memories yeah, from, from which point from when you were dropped in uh the case oh, was dropped yeah, here. Right. We were dropped, and, and we didn't give up. We, took, we went. We tried to go to the U.S. Supreme Court, and they wouldn't, you know, they, they held their nose and sent us away. And then we took the case over to the European Central Bank because the Vatican uses the euro, and there's anti-money laundering rules, and the European Central Bank uh, got their panties in a twist and said, no, 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 take it over to the European Commission and to their banking stability department or whatever it's called and we ran they ran us around a circle for three years and finally said you better take it to the vatican financial intelligence unit that we just made them set up for this very purpose and we took it <laughs> over there and after a one sentence email saying what do you want we never heard from them again so after another few years of writing letters we filed a canon law petition with the pope served him eight different ways um, and Pope Francis, I, I, I just he hasn't responded. Uh, <laughs> okay, imagine that. Uh, do, do, do they have an obligation to respond, or what is this? Just some kind of uh, uh, sham they're running? <laughs> well, they, under canon law, of course, they're, they're supposed to respond, but of course they only respond. They're like the U.S. Supreme Court. They only respond to a very few of the petitions to the Pope, and that would throw the rest of them out because, after all, only God is above him. <laughs> so this case, uh, boy, I'll tell you, if if not any, you know, it wasn't a total loss. Uh, I'm sure you spent much time, but you learned an awful lot. And an amazing story that I, I you know, hope that people, I try to get this show out to a lot of people because it really does show this interconnection between this, you know, the Vatican Jesuit order and our country and their control on politics, the court systems. So what it does, John, is it really helps someone like me who goes back into history and tries to show people certain things that somehow gets overlooked by these great historians who have all these PhDs and money and books behind their name, but they can't seem to get these facts uh, straight. And so what I'm saying is, man, it's interesting because people then can't just say, Greg, you know, it's ch what they usually say is, well, the Vatican has changed now. And I think your story in the last 30 seconds here before we take the break has uh, it makes people think twice. And you learn firsthand. So I imagine, John, there's so much more going on behind the scenes that we don't know. What do you think? Oh, absolutely. And I, and I would say, yeah, the Vatican's changed, but uh, not in the way people think. That smiling Pope is just a front. Right. All right, John. Well, listen, uh, i got a whole bunch of things I want to talk to you about uh, in the second half hour, including who Donald Trump is going to appoint as uh, our emissary, our ambassador to the Vatican. should be interesting. And we'll get back with John. You're listening to The Investigative Journal here on First Amendment Radio. Back in three minutes on The Investigative Journal. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment rights media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. 
corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for his holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. The book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Since the beginning of time, Kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. The following, the following program, program is labeled dangerous, dangerous and off limits by the Supreme, by the Supreme Jesuit, Jesuit Command. command. But stand tall, people. people. Listen, Listen up, 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 and you, you may, may just, just learn, learn something. something. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, this ain't happening, man. This can't be happening, man. This ain't happening. Okay, we're back for the second half hour with John Levy, and uh, I hope you caught the first half hour. And if you didn't, uh, go to my website at a-R-C-T-I-C-B-E-A-C-O-N.com. You can get replays of the show. Also look for it on YouTube. And really, it's a, it's a good history lesson as well as a lesson on what really is behind the, this hidden hand behind our government. The Vatican and the Jesuits are definitely included. John, uh, Trump's off to a heck of a start. He's uh, made good on a number of his promises so far in just five days. I, it's my first impression of Trump, and I want to get to the point about who he's going to uh, assign as the ambassador to the Vatican, which is a good uh, a good indication of his intention of how he's going to deal with the Vatican, because there are people on one side saying, oh, he's controlled by them. There's people on the other saying he's not. But I think uh, his appointment's going to tell us a lot. But before that, uh, he's off to such a good... I think he's, you know, to me, I, I've watched politics pretty closely. And in the four or five days he's been there, it seems like he's done more than Obama's done in eight years. Your thoughts on this? Well, yeah, he's, he, Mr. Trump's been busy undoing the Obama administration. He's got, admittedly, he's got a lot of work to do. But here you have a president who makes good on his promises. So we're, we're seeing a tremendous amount of progress just in the first, you know, the first week's not over yet. 
And there's no doubt that Soros wants to take him out one way or the other, whether they try to impeach him or they've already sued him, if you haven't heard, uh, on the emollients clause in the Constitution, which doesn't uh, hold water. But anyway, uh, a lot going on there. But let's get to this appointment, which is important regarding his uh, position with the Vatican. And what have you heard? Yeah, well, it, it, it's a very important position, especially for the Trump administration, because in the case of Mr. Trump, if you remember, during the election, Pope Francis literally tried to take him out uh, during the primary in South Carolina. Um, the Pope, it, it was unprecedented. The Pope made some remarks and said, what, what did he say, Greg, something about Donald Trump is uh, a bad guy, basically, is what he said. Yeah, and he was opposed and, uh, to his immigration policies, right? Yes, that's right. And I think Trump, yeah, was, was uh, not kindly disposed toward immigrants, and that made him bad. And I think uh, Trump, you know, essentially told the Pope to shove it. Mm -hmm. And um, people were like, I mean, the, the people go, oh, that's all for Trump. He told the Pope to go to hell. <laughs> I can't do that. Uh, you know, oh, my gosh, he's going to lose the election and. He won in South Carolina and went on to win the primary, you know, all the primaries, enough to, enough to get the nomination by a landslide. So there you go. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, Francis stuck his head out there and uh, tried to, I mean, it's probably the first time in 100 years a pope has uh, shot his mouth off like that. Well, a little bit of history. Me and John were talking about it at the break regarding an ambassador to the Vatican. And prior to Reagan, there was no such thing because of the Vatican connection. For, for over 100 years, people re realized the Vatican was involved with the killing of Lincoln. Now, one thing I find interesting, if you check the major uh, uh, books out now, there's a book by Bill O'Reilly. We all know who Bill is uh, on O'Reilly Factor on Fox. But he's got a, this whole killing section, uh, killing books. One is Killing Lincoln. But there's not much mentioned about the Vatican, and uh, the cover-up is even there. History Channel never mentions it, when the facts show that this needs to be put in the record. So we now have the ambassador. Reagan came in, a puppet to the Vatican, and, and did that. We have an ambassador to the Vatican. You've heard what the Jesuits want. That tells us an interesting story. Go ahead. Yeah, well, our current ambassador, Ambassador Ken Hackett, was the former head of Catholic Relief Services. And what's that? It's, pro, it's a pro-immigration organization, Catholic Relief Services. Essentially, the Vatican told Obama who they wanted to be appointed, and Obama appointed this guy Hackett. Now, Trump's not going to uh, do that. Nonetheless, the Jesuits, who control a, they have a house publication basically called America, right? Mm. America Magazine, for those of you who don't know, is run by the Vatican, and it's a nice, slick magazine. It's been around forever, and I don't know anyone who actually uh, subscribes to it, but it's in every library everywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right? So the Jesuits put it there. And uh, they would like, uh, the Jesuits would like uh, Rick Santorum. Rick Santorum, remember him? Mm-hmm. Grand president. Uh, they said he would be a good man. What's that, and Jeff? Go ahead. Not only a knight of Malta, he's not only a knight of Malta, but a member of Opus Dei. So hmm. they, they said, Mister, sending him to Rome would be a good way of sending a message to Rome. Yeah, would be sending a message that uh, um, um, we we uh, we're supplicating you. I don't think that's what Mister Trump wants. And then, of course, they're talking about other good Catholics like Steve Shabbat or Mike Kelly or Sam Brownback who would be uh, Frank Keating, all, all former people there who would be acceptable to the Vatican. And I think most of them uh, are Knights of Malta. They're also suggesting um, Trump could just go whole hog there and appoint uh, Carl Anderson, head of the Knights of Malta. That would probably be a big favorite of the Vatican too. So um, that's what they'd like to see. Now, I, I hopefully what Mr. Trump will do is appoint a non-Catholic to that position. That's what I, I, I mean, it, it, it always is a terrible conflict of interest to appoint people who are going to uh, kiss the papal ring. Right. So we'll have to wait and see uh, what he does on that. Now, one thing I wanted to mention, John, was that many people don't know you also have a license in England. You do a lot of cases overseas, and you wanted to update us on some things going on in Africa. Go ahead. 
Yeah, um, there, there are some major things going on in Africa that are, are only now just starting to make it into the news. Um, particularly in West Africa, there are two very large size uprisings affecting uh, about 100 million people. That's right, 100 million people in the Cameroons and Southeast Nigeria. Now, two contiguous regions by Afra, remember that, mm -hmm. and uh, southern Cameroons, which is less well-known, um, are in a state of uprising against the governments of Nigeria and Cameroon. And uh, there, you know, there's uh, been some shootings. It's been going on for a year now. Um, if that breaks out into a full-fledged war, I predict that will be the biggest humanitarian disaster of the century. All this stuff about Aleppo and Syria will be inconsequential uh, based on what's going on in Africa. And it, and it has two dimensions. Um, it, the Biafrans in southeast Nigeria are 99% Christian. And they are in revolt against the Muslim government of Nigeria. There's a Muslim. Uh, what's the uh, breakdown in numbers? Well, in Nigeria itself, it's about 50-50. Half Christian half Muslim. Now that doesn't make for, as you know, uh, when you have Muslims get over about the 15 to 20 percent threshold in a country, yeah, the, that country is headed for disaster. Well, in Nigeria, it's 50 percent Muslim. And now the president's a Muslim. And of course, Boko Haram, which is ISIS, is active killing Christians in Nigeria. And these people in this southeast corner of Nigeria that used to be known as Biafra are 99 percent Christian. And they're starting to feel, well, they're very worried. And there's 80 million of them. And uh, there's been shootings and all sorts of things going on. Um, a, a lot of these uh, these poor misguided people were marching around Trump posters last week, and about 20 of them were shot dead and 80 arrested. Um, so it's, it's not good what's going on there. And if war breaks out in that region, um, especially a religious war, which is why the mainstream media is not talking about it, you'll see floods of refugees heading over to Europe. I mean, not just a million or two. You'll see 10, 20, 30 million refugees come out of there. And likewise, over the border in Cameroon, uh, southern Cameroon is an English-speaking part of Cameroon. The rest of the country is French, and the French don't like the English speakers, and the English speakers are up in revolt. And uh, much the same thing, being hemmed in in the north by Muslims and on the... Uh, 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 other side by French speakers, so but they share a common border with Biafra there. So again, a, a lot of a lot of unrest. It's a powder keg, and I, I'm predicting if it goes bad, which it very well may, because no one's really looking at it, um, that that'll be the largest, probably just a, a disaster of biblical proportions. And so, do you think it's a war on Christianity behind the scenes? Yes, well, absolutely. It's, 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 no, it's not even behind the scenes. Boko Haram is supported by many Muslims in the Nigerian government. And again, Boko Haram is ISIS. They, they announced they are an affiliate of ISIS. So you have Boko Haram running around northern Nigeria, attacking Christians, burning churches. Um, you have uh, also bands of Fulani herders who are heavily armed going into Christian areas and shooting up villages. That, that's not reported either. And uh, you have the Nigerian military, which is also overwhelmingly Muslim, going in and shooting demonstrators. So some real problems. You also have Boko Haram active on the other side of the border in Cameroons. So, and, and again, the governments there are hostile to these two groups. On one side, English speakers. On the other side, Christians. Um, you and, said uh, and, something that they shut the uh, Internet off somewhere in Somalia, yeah. was it? Well, no, in, in southern Cameroon. Oh, okay. The uh, government shut, off, shut them off from the outside world just a few days ago to try to nip the uh, um, uprising that apparently is ongoing there in the bud. And in, um, in Biafra, they just shot a bunch of people who, for some reason, were waving uh, Trump posters. That got the, uh, I guess, Muslim soldiers angry, so they shot them. What's your involvement there so far? Are you representing some of these freedom groups? Yeah, yeah I am. I'm, I'm acting as a legal advisor to both groups, various groups that are on the ground there. So we, we're getting firsthand reports and videos, and we send them on to the International Criminal Court, 
uh, the, the court that is supposed to be uh, prosecuting war crimes, yeah. and uh, they don't do a thing. Yeah. It, it has something to do with the prosecutor there being a Muslim. Yeah, tell us about that court, because it's kind of mysterious. Many people don't understand it. Well, the International Criminal Court was a big project of the Clinton administration. And, however, Congress, in their wisdom, refused to participate in that disaster, um, much like um, the U.S. refused to participate in Wilson's League of Nations. So the U.S. Congress got one look at what the International Criminal Court was, and they said, "Uh uh-uh, we're not going to go for that. There's no control over it. We we don't know who's going to be the judges, and they'll be, you can bet, dollars to donuts, they'll be indicting Americans left and right and dragging them off to The Hague and putting them on uh, political show trials. So the U.S. is not participating in it, but the Europeans signed up for it, and they made the Africans sign up up for it. So it's functioning, but not very well. Uh, And and they decided in their wisdom, the best thing to do would be to put a Muslim in charge of it. So, of course, uh, this prosecutor, a woman, Muslim, Fatou Ben Souda, refuses to prosecute ISIS or Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab or or Al-Qaeda or any of the uh, radical Islamic groups, even though they are the ones committing war crimes around the world. Right, so they can actually go cut people's heads off and then nothing happens. Well, they do worse than cut people's heads off, and there's video footage. And, of course, the Europeans, uh, you know, they're they're, they're fine with that because, of course, uh, no one really wants to get to the bottom of who is uh, producing all that high-quality video footage of the atrocities to begin with? Where did ISIS, Greg, get all that high-quality production equipment, Hollywood-style stuff that they use to film all the killings and murders and, and burnings and, and, and rapes and whatever it is they do and broadcast it around the world? Uh, it wouldn't do to have someone investigate it. Now would it? No, not to mention all the weapons and high-powered... Well, you know, uh, no, no telling where an investigation like that might lead to. Exactly. So then you send these reports of the Christian persecution in, in uh, the Cameroons and other places, and, and they totally ignore it. We've been doing it for years. It, 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 they ignore it. The UN ignores it as well. Um, so very few people have spoken out about it. That really the only <laughs> well-known figure in the U.S. is former uh, Congressman Bob Dorden, who has spoken out about it. And, of course, he was a former uh, pilot who flew relief supplies into Biafra during the war there back in the uh, 60s. Yeah, I remember years ago I interviewed Bob. He seems like a really good guy. Yep, he, he is. Uh, Congressman Dornan is the only one who ever has spoken up about Biafra, uh, at least of the current situation there. Because he lived through it firsthand, so he knows. He knows what's going on there and uh, what sort of persecutions uh, would take place. Can you imagine, John, if this breaks out and all, you know, compound this refugee problem in Europe in what's going on now with the flood of refugees, it would be a total changeover, a makeup of, of Europe, wouldn't it? Oh, it, it would destroy because the refugees would come up through a southern route. So they actually they'd come in uh, probably, again, through the Libyan route. Uh, many of them would die along the way, and it would completely overwhelm the Italians this time. Italy would, the government would fall. A second wave of these refugees would go to England because they have relatives there. And and it would, again, completely cause a crisis in England if you had a million or two refugees come in there. Right. You know, and I I still talk to people when I, you know, about Italy and places in Europe that I uh, know about when I lived there. And they said it's completely different than what it was in the 80s and the 90s. And this flood of refugees, even in Rome, especially Milan in the north, has created such friction there that there are certain neighborhoods that Italians can't even walk in anymore. Uh, it's totally amazing. Yeah, I mean, I was in Milan about three years ago, and even then, if you got near the main train station, it was horrible. There were people bedding down for the nights in the streets. I'm going like, who are these? What are, oh, there are hundreds of people sleeping in the streets, maybe thousands in Milan. Who mm-hmm. are thinking like, well, who are these? They're the kind of dark-skinned. Are these gypsies? What's going on here? No, no, it, they, those were Syrian refugees. 
um, that were starting to flow even then back in uh, a couple of years ago when I was last in Milan. It, it was, and, and then they, they get closer to the uh, train station and there's tons of South Asians there, Bangladeshis or say, uh, people from Sri Lanka, mm-hmm. Burmese. And, and they've all just have congregated in these areas in Italy, and, and they're sleeping on the streets. Right. And, you know, doesn't it seem interesting, though, when you look at this, inf- this first flood of refugees, it appeared that all the leaders of Europe, for example, Renzi in Italy and Merkel, who's still there, uh, England now, chain, you know, getting a backlash with Brexit, all the leaders, including Obama, were all, and the Pope, all pro-refugee. Now you're seeing a backlash how do you think this is going to affect Merkel? Is this going to create some kind of change? I don't know. Merkel is in there pretty firm. I, I don't know. I mean, Merkel is the last stand of globalism. So I think uh, all the Soros money, Clinton Foundation, everybody's in there behind Merkel. She's going to be really hard to take out. That, that's what I think. Um, and that whole propaganda machine in favor, you know, that, that propaganda machine is still cranking out images of the little babies from Syria, all bought and paid for by Soros, I might add, or similar organizations. You know, it's interesting, just a side note, I was talking to a couple people in Italy, and they had planned that they had Trump rallies actually going on on Inauguration Day, supporting Trump's inauguration, and uh, they were getting backlash from a number of people. It's interesting uh, Italy, as well as certain places in Europe, of course, with Brexit, uh, we're seeing a backlash towards this. How do you think the Pope is involved in this? What's he going to try to do? Well, th- this is why we're watching that, as you said earlier, the ambassador nomination, because I don't think Donald Trump's going to cave in to the people in the GOP who want to go along with the business plan there and appoint a good Catholic to that position. The Pope is one of the major cheerleaders for globalization. Just remember... The major, the sanctuary city movement, Catholic charities, all of that, those are the major importer of illegal aliens into the U.S. They're also the ones who are bringing in uh, refugees into Europe. Remember, where they threw open the churches for refugees, all all sorts of things. The Pope is a big promoter of moving people around, and uh, he wants to, uh, you know, destabilize governments mix people up and uh, again for the uh, global global for globalism right you know and you would think that uh, I think it's pretty obvious if we're having all these Christians being persecuted in Africa uh, what's to stop them once the flood come you know what uh, stop them in Europe and America I mean this is all a plan I hopefully we can put an end to it your thoughts yeah, it's a plan, all right. It's the, you know, Greg, it's the devil's plan. Because yeah. what happens, first you import Muslims, right? Think mm-hmm. about this in Europe. First you import Muslims to destabilize civil society and break down the borders and cause unrest. And, and of course, you can never, can never um, assimilate these Muslims. Then the next thing would be, how about a wave of people who've been persecuted by Muslims? Mm-hmm. Well, what'll happen there? They'll start fighting with the Muslims. And then, and then you'll have complete anarchy. So apparently the devil's plan, which is what the Vatican is backing here, is complete anarchy and, and fighting. Um, I don't know. Which it, will lead know. to uh, more uh, more control, or kind of a one-world control system. It, 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 it will. That's, that's the first you have to have the conflict, and then over the ruins of civilization you impose your new order. You know something, I've got about four minutes. Uh, I wanted to talk about U- uh, UBS and inform people on that case because it has a Clinton connection. Go ahead. Yeah, UBS is one of the largest banks in the world. It was a merger between Swiss National Bank and uh, Union Bank of Switzerland. Um, and I have a case against them. It's going into the Ninth Circuit next month regarding several billion dollars that was uh, deposited from Indonesia by the uh, vice president of Indonesia back when it was politically okay to do that. And uh, he died, and UBS just kind of like kept the money and destroyed the records. And it's not the first time they've done that. And uh, it's going to be an interesting case because under the Obama administration, it was decided, and with direct input from Hillary Clinton, I might add, two things. One, UBS, no matter how many crimes they commit, they're always going to get a free get-out-of-jail card, although now they finally got convicted as a felon in Connecticut and put on probation. And, and secondly, that 
foreign corporations who are present and doing business in the U.S. cannot be sued in the U.S. So if we want to sue UBS, we have to go to Switzerland, even though UBS does more business in the U.S. than in Switzerland. Mm. Thank you, Obama, administration of Obama Supreme Court. Wow, that's amazing because the UBS case, I remember even Giuliani bringing up Clinton's connection during the campaign to covering up a, a whole bunch of names that were uh, being requested uh, for prosecution, and she had given speeches and basically limited their uh, exposure. That's the best way I can put it. Yeah, well, UBS got caught three times committing massive felonies, tax evasion, um, uh, banking evasion, and finally fixing the in, uh, foreign currency interest rates was what is what they went down on and ple- pleaded guilty to a single count of wire fraud. Somehow it boiled down to that, but they, they committed hundreds and hundreds of crimes uh, that, that you or I would have got Madoff-like sentences for, and UBS basically walks with probation and a $200 million fine. So how do you, uh, what's the steps in this case? Where are you at right now in this present case? Well, we're going to go in and we're going to argue uh, before the Ninth Circuit in a couple of weeks that UBS surely can be sued in the U.S., not only because they do business in the U.S., but now they're on probation, just like any other criminal. They're on probation, and I have their probation uh, documents, and those probation documents say they can't do anything without the permission of their probation officer. So... Uh, they're at home in the U.S., I, I, at least for the term of the probation, and they can be sued here. That's what I say. Uh, last thoughts here. we got about a minute. Uh, Trump's going to put up his Supreme Court nominee next week. Uh, definitely it'll be a conservative to take over for Scalia. Do you see any changes in the court under Trump? Uh, yeah, I don't know if the guy, it, it would be great if the guy who's coming in is not a Catholic because we had a Catholic majority Supreme Court under Obama. So I'm not sure about that, but we'll have to see. All right, John. Well, listen, we're all out of time. And the one thing I want to mention is keep in, uh, go back to some of my shows uh, going back, God, oh, time flies, John, maybe over a decade now regarding a lot of things we talk about. Uh, regarding John's cases, and he'll be back with us in the future. But go to my website at arcticbeacon.com. And, John, I want to thank you so much. And uh, in the last few seconds here, I hope that we can get some justice uh, for the people in the in, in the genocide case. And keep us in touch with that, okay? Will do. Thank you, Greg. Okay, that was John Levy. We'll be back tomorrow on the Investigative Journal. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin, the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast, and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left-behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org.